It's time for the Hockey Writers Grind Line. A weekly show covering everything Detroit Red Wings. Brought to you by our own iconic top line of Wings writers. Sit back and enjoy the grind. Hello, everybody, and welcome back into another episode of the Grind Line presented by the Hockey Writers. I'm your host, Matthew Zator. And as always, joined in by my defense partner, Devin Little. Devin, uh, first of all, how's it going on a night uh, Red Wings are losing 4 nothing as we record to the Winnipeg Jets? But uh, and we have another show to do, so let's go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, safe to say that they could probably use us out on the ice there, right, Matt? Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> help, help, out their, help out the decor a little bit. But yeah. It's been a good week, um, this game notwithstanding. So excited to be here with you. Excited to do another show. Yes, for sure. And uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone that commented uh, on our new format. Uh, thanks for the comments. And uh, we'll keep going, as everyone has uh, has said on, in the comment section. So, um, And also, thanks for, thanks for all the questions we got as well. I reached out. Got, we got a comment corner going. We got half the show comment corner after we get to our first two sections. But uh, with that, let's get going with our one good, one bad to start the episode here. Uh, Devin, uh, a good and a bad from the past week here. Uh, so my one good um, is going to be Alex Nadelkovich, actually. Um, obviously, I spent the majority of this season in the AHL being the Griffin starter. Completely uh, unsuspected turn of events there. But uh, the Red Wings called him up. Um, a week or two ago and uh now they're kind of giving him the starting reins which is kind of cool to see and uh what does he do in return he you know pitches a win against the penguins and he uh gets a win against his old team the carolina hurricanes and in that hurricanes game specifically he he looked like the nadelkovich that the redwoods traded for two years ago mm-hmm. um it was it was very exciting to see and um I, I I'm excited for him and I'm, 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 I'm very happy with how he's performed because given how this season has gone, he very well could have just kind of phoned it in. And even with this call up, it's not really cared because, you know, for all intents and purposes, his time with Detroit could have been done, but yeah, um, good for him for, you know, putting his best, best foot forward and helping his team win games. And then my one bad is going to be just overall um, poor defensive stuff basically yeah. <laughs> um and or you know like you said we're watch uh doing this during the winnipeg game they're down for nothing Holbrook's just kind of fighting for his life right now he's not getting a ton of support defensively and then in that game against the penguins um where they they won seven to four but um ned was kind of fighting for his life at times too uh you, you let up four goals right um and that's just kind of been an ongoing thing this season they are better defensively than they've been in prior and prior seasons but uh, there's still some really bad habits there that uh, I guess will take some more time to iron out. So, um, yeah, good goaltending, bad defense. That's my one good one bad. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been a, a rough year. I I mean, like I say, at the beginning of the year, it looked like they were doing well. I mean, it, it uh, you know, figuring out the system, obviously there were some hiccups and stuff, but it seems like they're still figuring out the system. And that – that may take a bit. I mean, usually with new coaches, it takes about a season to kind of get going and you'll see adjustments next season, I'm sure. And um, we'll see a better team as well. So there's a lot of lots of lots of positives as well going in um, throughout the season as well. So. All right. Well, uh, my one good one bad uh, is going to be in the same vein, that Pittsburgh Penguins game. David Perron with the hat trick against his former yeah. team. He, he did only play, I mean, not very, not a long time with the Pittsburgh Penguins. He had, you know, season in a bit, um, but it's a former team of his and uh, it lit him up. So I had a hat trick against the <laughs> Penguins there and uh, always great to see guys get hat tricks. And Perron uh, has been a, a thorn in a lot of team sides throughout his career and, uh, you know, looks like the Penguins are another one that he's, he's been able to do that again. So uh, that's my good. And then my bad is uh, is today's game <laughs> for nothing. I, you know, the Winnipeg Jets are a team fighting for the playoffs. And, I, you know, they're a lot desperate, more desperate. But the Red Wings have been able to beat the Carolina Hurricanes. They beat the Penguins. Would have been good for them to maybe try to spoil another team's uh playoff hopes here but 
doesn't look like it's going to be unless they have a big comeback, which can happen. I mean, the way the, the way this, the NHL has been this season comebacks for nothing is like, whatever. <laughs> it seems like you're able to come back uh, a lot of comebacks in the league this year. So even last season, there was a lot of it. So I think there's no lead that's safe uh, right now. So we'll see. We may, we may be talking about a comeback uh, in the next episode, or maybe as we record here to see, uh, keep an eye on that score. All right. Well, as we got the one good one, bad, let's talk big story. That's this last week prospects and lots of top prospects signed their ELCs this week. And uh, some playing in Grand Rapids, some joining the Red Wings. So, first of all, they signed Carter Major and William Wallander. And then the big guy, Marco Casper, uh, the most recent ELC that was signed. He is actually with the Red Wings right now. He actually took warm-ups um, for, against the Winnipeg Jets here. Didn't play. I mean, he's not playing right now. But that's to be expected. I mean, a lot of the time, they kind of make sure they, you know, get some practices in and... And then we'll see Casper, I'm sure. If he's with the team, he'll probably play eventually. So, uh, Devin, what are your thoughts on these moves? Three top prospects getting entry-level deals that Detroit Red Wings fans are going to see either in Grand Rapids or with the Red Wings here. Yeah, the last time I did a top 25 Red Wings prospects ranking, um, these three, Casper, um, Mazur, well, not Casper, Wallander and Mazer were the um yeah, okay, yeah, rewind. The 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 three <laughs> here included here. I, I forgot what I was trying to say. The three <laughs> included here um were the ones that weren't with Detroit in the top five. Um the other two that were in the top five were Simon Edvinson and Albert Johansson. Both of those guys were in Grand Rapids. These three were the other top five. They weren't with um, you know, they weren't in Michigan. So it's exciting to see them come to Michigan first and foremost. Yeah. Um, it's also exciting because, um, I happened to be at the game, uh, Mazer's first professional game, um, with the Griffins. And while he didn't get on the score sheet, um, he looked like he belonged. Um, he, a play that really sticks out to me. Um, it was, uh, in the third period, I'm pretty sure. And it was a, uh, a two on one for, um, the Chicago Wolves. And he, he ended up making a desperation play, got on his belly on the ice and got a stick to disrupt the pass and broke up that two on one. Um, doesn't show up on the score sheet, but that very, yeah. if, if he doesn't do that, that play might've ended up on the score sheet. Um, it's just a gutsy play from a gutsy player. Um, I bring up Tyler Bertuzzi a lot when I talk about Carter Mazur, cause I think he can be that type of player. Mm -hmm. And those are the type of, you know, maximum effort, do everything you can to help your team plays that Tyler Bertuzzi makes. So to see him already doing it in game one of his pro career is like, oh yeah, this this, this kid is going to be exactly what I think he's going to be. <laughs> um, and then, uh, you know, Wallander, very excited to see him play. Um, you know, just adding more to that loaded pipeline in the D uh, on defense, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then Casper, I mean, I'm just shocked that he <laughs> like skipped the Grand Rapids phase. They have him already with Detroit. I'm excited to see him play. Um, and then my kind of my final thought on this is um you know a couple weeks ago we had jacob and uh dayton on and we talked about the status of the red wings rebuild right and how um even eisenman said that you know you could make an argument that they're not where they should be well now they've they've got Mazer signed they've got wallander signed they've got casper in detroit um i think that now that these prospects are um are here i i didn't even mention simon edvinson who's been playing with the red wings recently too right yeah. um I think that now we're starting to get a really real idea of uh, where this rebuild's actually at because this is where we, like this is what a rebuild is about. It's about your prospects. It's about adding, you know, creating your future nucleus. That nucleus has basically just been Cider and Raymond the last two years. Yeah. So to now have Mazer and Wallander and Casper all in Michigan now, you can start to see where this rebuild is headed, and uh, I think that's exciting. And I think that. Um, now I kind of want to want to go back to two weeks ago and uh, kind of have that conversation with Jacob and Dayton again and be like, ha not so fast. Yeah. This, right? rebuild is, <laughs> this rebuild is uh, it's, it's maybe not where it should be, but um, the plot, the, the, the most exciting prospects they have are uh, as close to Detroit as they can be, or some of them are in Detroit. So full speed ahead on this rebuild. 
for sure. And they all, it's crazy how all three of them signed in this last week. I mean, it, yeah. <laughs> you don't see that very often. Fun week. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, Major coming off a great season in the NCAA. I mean, uh, an alternate captain, um, one of their top players. I, you know, he had over like 22 goals, 37 points, almost matched his career high from the previous season. We had 38, but he did have a career high in goals. So, uh, you know, great, great season for him and coming over. And like you said, looks looks like he he belongs in in the prep pro level. Yes, only is. He's playing as we record right now as well. Um, so, you know, he'll he'll get he'll get his games. He'll probably he may we'll see if he gets a call up or two. I mean, I probably won't see him this season. But uh, you know, he's in Grand Rapids right now. Uh, Marco Casper, we will probably see him uh, in the NHL at some point if he's up here. Uh, and he's also coming off a, a pretty good season. And with Rogla, yeah. eight goals, 23 points. And that's pretty good for in the SHL and had three assists in nine playoff games as well. So, uh, you know, we'll see what he looks at the NHL level. And uh, that's going to be exciting in his de- debut whenever that comes. And uh, we'll, we'll be talking about it, I'm sure. I'm, I'm glad he's not playing as we record here because yeah. <laughs> it'll be good to dissect his game. Uh, so uh, that'll come. And hopefully it's this week sometime. We can talk about it next episode. But We'll have to find out. And Wallander, uh, I've always loved him as a defenseman. I've had him in trade request, trade proposals for uh, for the Canucks in a long time. So <laughs> I, I'm sure he's not going anywhere. Uh, and now that he's signed with the Red Wings, uh, he's a big part of the future defense because uh, he's got a great future in the NHL, I think. And uh, we'll talk about the defense. Uh, well, let's talk about it right now. Uh, we'll start our comment corner, and that this is a, a segment we used to have a lot. Uh, it was a regular segment when Pat was the host, and uh, we brought it back. And uh, again, thanks to everyone who put comments. We've got we've got quite a few questions we'll go through here. So let's start off with one, uh, and this is about the defense. And uh, question is from Ripe French Toast Sixteen. What a great name! Uh, you too. <laughs> uh, and the question is, how bright is the future of Detroit's defense? And this is even even with the lack of right-handed D-men in the system, which is we've talked about at length, that there are overabundance of left-handed defense. And the right isn't as strong. So uh, let's talk about it. Uh, Devin, what do you think? Uh, how bright is the future of, de- of the defense, even with, even with that uh, left-side logjam? Well, consider that... Um, the following are all Red Wings prospects. You got Simon Edvinson, you got Albert Johansson, William Wallander, Donovan Sabringo, Emil Vero, Shai <laughs> Boom. Uh, who else am I forgetting? Uh, Jared McIsaac. Um, who else? Anyways, you get the point, right? <laughs> um, that's more left-handed defensemen than there are spots in a lineup. And I didn't mention Cider, um, and anybody else who's currently signed to be with the Red Wings. So, um, I think that the future is very bright just because you have you have more talent than you know what to do with, basically. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, the handedness thing is is potentially a problem and something that they um may need to address in the future. Um, but there's no rule that says you have to have three lefties and three righties. That's just kind of the ideal setup. There's mm-hmm. no rule that says that though. Um, and to that point, if you have an abundance of something. You can use that abundance to address an area of need. If you have, you know, if, if there's a team out there that has a righty that they need to move on from and they're looking to add a lefty, boy, do they have a really good trade partner in Detroit, yeah. right? <laughs> um, and you can't make those moves unless you have an abundance. Um, it's it's not necessarily smart to trade from an area of need to address an area of need. You want to trade from an area you have an abundance. And that's what the Red Wings have. So. I think the uh, the future of Detroit's defense is very bright. Um, not just because of the guys at the top, Cider and Edmondson. I think those are like the uh, the workhorses that the te- the the, the seed core is going to be built around. But to then add the Wallanders, the Johansons, um, and others to this group, I I think it's going to be a big blue line. I think it's going to be a uh, surprisingly mobile blue line a uh, skilled blue line and a blue line that isn't afraid to uh, assert themselves physically as well. 
Um, I think it's kind of the the perfect combination of what you want from defensemen. So I think Sider's is kind of the blueprint. And I think that's a really good blueprint to follow for what this defense is going to look like in the future. So to uh, wrap this up, how bright is the future of Detroit's defense? So bright that I need sunglasses. <laughs> Uh, perfect. I mean, the thing is, and there's so many defensemen. I'm looking at them, and I'm excited to see them all. I mean, yeah. Shy Boom. I mean, he's going to be a beast in the NHL. I, I believe, and that's <laughs> and that's a guy that uh, you know he's he can be physical. He's mobile. I had a great season with the University of Denver, 21 points in 38 games. I uh, you know that, and that's a that's one. That's only one of the many that we've talked. You know, Wallander, we've talked about already. Uh, another guy, Mil Vero. I mean, yep. yep. He's again not a lot of points. Ten points this season in his first uh, season in the AHL. I, uh, you know, that's not a lot. But it, it, but, but that's not what his game is, right? He's, he's 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 more of the the quiet type, right? Yeah. Well, I'm totally both. Um, he's ECHL yeah. numbers too. Oh, gotcha. Seven yeah. points in in 41 Still. games with Grand Rapids. So uh, he's been with five games with the Toledo Walleye as well. But most of his season has been the AHL. But yeah, Vero, his game isn't that point. So he's more that, and we've talked about him uh, being mm-hmm. that complimentary guy to an offensive defenseman. So um, yeah, there's just so many guys. And who knows, Eisenman may add another one uh, yep. in the draft yep. this year. So there's some guys at the top that we've talked about, uh, Reinbacher, uh, Axel Sandin Pelica. I mean, these two are right-handers that yep. could uh, bolster their defense that is abundantly left-handed so but yeah i i believe so too this this defense is bright and like you said Devin, it you can trade from strengths and that's you know you can trade a lefty for a right guy right hand guy and i don't think it's as big of a deal anymore i mean a lot of defensemen can play the left side and the right side they can play both um you know it's just something you have to learn because you know some teams have a lot of one side. I mean, what, you're never going to play because gonna, we want to have the left, right. I mean, that that's not always the case. So uh, yeah, they have a lot of good defensemen and it is, it's going to be a bright future. It's very, very exciting to watch in the coming um, years uh, as they get here and develop. All right. Well, that's one question, but before we get to another one, uh, let's get to our first off the rush and uh, let's keep in the vein of, the comments because we, we've got a lot of them and there's some a quick one here and this is from uh i did not oh paradox our friend paradox side paradox thank you for for throwing in this question late yesterday um his question is what rookies do you think will make the team next season and uh, we've talked about a few of them here but uh who will start the season with detroit uh i'll answer this one first I'm going to say Marco Casper is going to make the team. I I think he's already a pro level player. I mean, again, we haven't seen him play in the NHL yet, but uh, we've talked about him being that good two way center. Uh, I think he can play on a third and fourth line already. Um, so I'm going to say he'll make the team out of camp, and um, well, he'll probably play a couple of games before the end of the season here. But I think he will. I don't know if he'll be full time, but I'm pretty sure he'll make the team. I, another guy I want to say is, um, is Edvinson because he's already been in the NHL. He looks really good. I think he'll start on, uh, on defense as well. So those are my two guys, uh, Devin, um, what do you think? What rookies do you think will make uh, the team next year? Yeah, I, uh, I'm just going to kind of echo what you said there. I think Edvinson is a virtual lock. I don't want to say like a slam dunk, <laughs> but he's, he's, I, I have like 98% confidence he'll be with the team next season. Um, and I think that Casper has a really good shot to make the team as well. I think the fact that he's with the team right now speaks volumes to what the team believes he is at this point in his career. Um, I think that for him, it's just going to come down to whether or not he can um, get enough playing time to warrant being in, in Detroit versus Grand Rapids. Mm-hmm. Cause if he's in Grand Rapids, he's going to be force fed minutes. He's going to play, Top line, top line power play, all that good stuff. Um, if he's in Detroit, I think he's looking at more of a middle six role. And I think he can do that. It's just if he can do it um, versus if he's just kind of surviving versus thriving, right? Mm-hmm. And then one other name I do want to throw out because I like his game. I've, you know, choo-choo, all that good stuff. <laughs> um, I do think Albert Johansson has a chance to make the team next year. Um, he's played a full year in Grand Rapids now, so he knows what the North American game is all about. Plays a nice complimentary role as a defenseman. 
And I think that, um, yeah, I, he's, he's somebody that, uh, if he has a good summer, he can, um, make a really good case for himself to make the team next year. Yeah. Uh, I, they're great names. And again, we may see some surprises and as well, yeah. I mean, there's some guys that just, you know, they have a great summer and they come in and outwork everyone else to make the team. So, and again, this question isn't saying they're going to be full-time NHLers. This is who will make the team. So, um, yeah. thanks paradox yeah. for the, for the quick question to add to our off the rush. And, uh, I got one more here. I'm um, just going in off the vein of Marco Casper. Um, and these three that have signed who plays the most in, in Detroit next season of those three. Ooh. Casper. Yeah. Um, I, I think Casper, and I think that, um, if he, if he doesn't start the season in Detroit, I think he'll end the season in Detroit. It's just a matter of how he gets to that point. Yeah, I, I think so too. I think Casper probably gets the most games. Uh, Major, I think probably plays mostly in Grand Rapids and Wallander. I think so too, because I mean, unless he surprises and looks really good yeah. um, and beats out a few guys, maybe, but, uh, and of course, injuries always get thrown in there as well. So uh, we'll see. All right. Well, before we get to our next uh, two uh, comment corner questions here, I got to pay the bills here. And um Hockeypedia, as always, is our sponsor for this episode. Make sure you're checking out Hockeypedia at the Hockey Writers. Um, link in the description. Lots of great information. Uh, player pages for almost, well, all the regular NHLers. Uh, and we keep adding every day uh, any rookies that start, um, you know, historic players. Uh, we, we got stuff getting added to that, uh, that database every day. Trophies, uh, anything you want to know about that. And um well, Boston Bruins just clinched the President's Trophy. So if you want to know who else has won the President's Trophy over the years and how far they made it in the playoffs, which is not a lot of guys, not a lot of teams do. So we'll see what the Boston Bruins can do <laughs> with their historic season into the playoffs. But check out Hockeypedia, uh, link in the description below. All right. Well, let's get to our next common corner question. This is from Bill B Culls9. And uh, this is a uh, this is an interesting question. I uh, the question is, is it possible for young players slash draftees to develop NHL level finishing skills? As an example, is there still hope for Philip Zadina to develop into a finisher or is it too late for him? Devin, what do you think? <laughs> Poor Zadina. Yeah, um, of course, he's. I do. <laughs> I do want to start this off uh, by saying that Carter Mazur just recorded his first um, professional point. He got an assist. There so, we go. Shout out to Carter Mazur. Um, so do I think that players can develop finishing, uh, finishing touch? I do. And the reason why I'm going to use a uh, player from the Buffalo Sabres to illustrate this point. That player is Tage Thompson. Yeah. I'm sure you've all heard of him because all that dude does is score now. <laughs> Through his first three complete seasons in the NHL, he had 18 goals through basically 150 games. Uh, I don't know about you, but I don't think that illustrates a player who has finishing touch. I think that um, a lot of people were down on Thompson because he had 18 goals in 150 games. Guess what he's done since then? <laughs> <laughs> what, 40 plus goals? <laughs> he has. <laughs> yeah, 44 this year. He has 82 in total over the last two seasons. Um, all that dude does is finish now. Uh, so... To answer the question, yes, players sure can develop finishing touch. Um, it's just a matter of reps and usage and coaching and mm -hmm. all that good stuff. Um, do I think that Zadina can develop into a finisher? I do. I do think that um, kind of similar to what we do with Michael Rasmussen, we kind of have to start readjusting our um, our expectations for him. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he went sixth overall. Um at this point, I don't know that he's going to turn into a sixth overall caliber player, but that doesn't mean he can't turn into a darn good, you know, solid player. I think if he can turn himself into a, a player that can consistently score 20 goals, 25, I think you take that. I think you're happy with it. Yeah, probably not who they should have picked, but you got to make lemonade out of lemons when you have yeah. them. Michael Rasmussen probably drafted a little too high, but at this point, I don't think anybody dislikes the fact that he's on the team because you made the best of it and you turned him into a player that is useful. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, do, do I think, you know, you can, you can develop finishing? Absolutely. It's just a matter of time and reps and being put in the right position and coaching all those things I said, 
And I think for the Red Wings, um, that's going to be something that they really need to get, whether it's in the draft or free agency or a trade or whatever. I don't know that they have like a bona fide finisher on the team. And that is kind of a big problem for them. They have plenty of guys that can create plays, but you can create, create all the plays you want. It doesn't matter if you don't have anyone who could finish them. Yeah. Um, so I think whether it's a player like Zadina or whoever else developing that finishing touch or them going out and getting somebody, I do think that's something they need to address because um, yeah, like I said, plenty of playmakers, but nobody to really finish those plays off. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think I think it is possible to develop that. You have to have those skills in the first place. I yeah, believe. absolutely. I mean, you can't just all of a sudden become a goal scorer. But uh, Zadine has shown in the past that he can score goals. I mean, there's there's a reason he was drafted so high and why why he was ranked so high during that draft. Um, yeah, it yeah. wasn't like Detroit reached from the seventh round and picked him in the first round. I mean, this is yeah, this yeah. is a guy that was ranked to go there. So. He had finishing skills. Lots of scouting reports said he could. Um, so it's just he hasn't been able to put it together consistently in the NHL, and that that sometimes happens. I think I think like you said, coaching, um, line mates, uh, different situations. You know, get that. And Tage Thompson didn't get it done in St. Louis. I go to Buffalo, and you know, whoever coaching told him how to you know do some certain things or just development in general. Um, got him there and Zadina can get there. I think Um, not saying he will. I mean, it, you know, sometimes it doesn't happen. I mean, there's guys that it just doesn't come together. Unfortunately that could be with Zadina, but he could definitely develop that finishing skill. Just, it'll just depend on if he gets in the right situation also may not be in Detroit. And that's what Thompson had the same thing. He didn't happen yeah. in St. Louis once he was traded. And that's when it started happening in Buffalo and, so Zadina may have to blossom somewhere else. And we'll see if it's going to be in Detroit or um, he's traded to another team. All right, next question. And this is on uh, the off season. And this is from Dr. Detroit, another great name. I, who are the wings re-signing and who's hitting the road? And do you see them involved in trades with other teams that have big UFAs to sign to big contracts? That have, I'm, I'm guessing teams that have to shed salary. Um, so I'll answer this one first. I think there's a few guys that will be re-signing. I, you know, there's, they do have a lot of uh, free agents that are coming up. I mean, guys like, oh, well, let's start, let's start off with the guys that I think aren't going to come back. Um, I don't think chase on is coming back. I think he's, he's a guy that just kind of got a flash in the pan here. And uh, they, like we said in the last episode, there's a lot of guys that are going to, we talked about these rookies that like Marco Casper, if you re-sign Chase on, he really has no room uh, to come into the lineup. I don't think he's coming back. Uh, you know, there's Pia Suter. He's, I think, I think he's not coming back either. There's another guy that's, you know, he had a good season when he first came over, but I think, uh, I think he's, there's other players that have kind of, played better and, and taken up. But I mean, that's another guy that could come back. I think he probably won't. Uh, let's see here. What other guys? Yeah. I think those are the two uh, for me that aren't, aren't going to come back. There's Jordan Osterley, I think will be uh, a guy coming back. Cause I think he's been a really good depth defenseman for the Red Wings. but again, there's other defensemen that are coming up as well, but uh, I think he's coming back. So Devin, what do you think? Who, who's hitting the road? Who's who's re-signing? And uh, oh, that other part of the question, I'll answer after you. <laughs> uh, I might even go as far as to say that anybody who's a UFA on this team might not stick around. Like I, I go down the mm -hmm. list and it's like, eh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, you can you can make some arguments. I mean, Pew Suter has been pretty good in the role he's been in, but like. You could make room for him. You could get rid of him, make room for somebody else, or he can find a bigger role with somebody else. Like it, it's it's they can they can make that work, but also I don't know they like need to make that work. Yeah. Um, the RFAs, I mean, you can more or less expect them to resign because they're RFAs. I'm not sure about Gus Lindstrom. I think he's one to keep an eye on. I think they might let him go just because he um, he hasn't uh, done enough to stick in the lineup. And as we've talked about. They have plenty of guys coming up the pipeline who uh, would like a shot 
to, you know, play in the NHL. Mm. Uh, Joe Valeno, I expect him to come back. I don't know. You know, I'm not expecting like a big deal or anything, but I expect he'll be back. Um, I think the biggest area to look at when it comes to who's staying, who's going and who might come in, honestly, is the goalies mm-hmm. because Huso is signed for two more years. So he's he's not going anywhere. But both Nadelkovic and Helberg are pending UFAs. Um, both of them have been fine, maybe even like less than fine this season. <laughs> Um, so you could probably make a really confident argument that you don't need to bring back either of them, but then you do need to get a goalie because somebody needs to back up who. So, um, <laughs> I, I've actually talked about this in an article I wrote a week or two ago. Um, and I think if you're looking for somebody who's just, who's going to be cheap, who knows the team and can kind of just help bridge the gap until a guy like Costa's is ready to go. I think you can re-sign Helberg to a really cheap yeah. contract for like two years. Um, He's not going to move the needle, but you know, you know, you know what you're going to get from him. I wonder about Ned because he has looked good. Like I said, in my one good, but also I wonder if he's he would look he would want a bigger opportunity than the one that he might get in Detroit. Yeah, and I don't blame him for that. Um, and then also there's just the, the you know, wouldn't you want to go see if you can improve on one of those guys, right? Like I said, Helberg would be fine. Maybe go find a guy who could be great, right? Yeah. Um. We we're talking about bridging the gap to bridging the gap until Cosa. What if Cosa never comes? Right, you can't just put all your eggs in that basket. So, um, I don't know. I I, I I wouldn't be surprised if they're looking for a goalie in the uh, in the market. Um, they do need to spend some money. I do want to throw that out there. I know there's another part of this question we got to answer, but um, they actually need to spend. I think it's like eight million dollars in the off season to hit the cap floor. Yeah. <laughs> so, they def- so they definitely have to spend some money one way or another. Um, it's just a matter of where those funds are going to be allocated because even the guys I said, like, like yeah, they signed Joe Valeno. He's not going to cost eight million. No. Even if they re-sign Pew Suter, he's probably he's only going to get like you know three million at most, right? Like they still got to spend some money. So, um, I do expect them to spend money before we like fully dive into the second part of this question. <laughs> Yeah, I, I do. I see that too. I mean, again, they don't have massive contracts to hand out here. Uh, they did their big re-signing of uh, Larkin. That's done. Yep. Um, you know, and guys, like, I mean, there's some free agents out there uh, that, I mean, I don't think they're going after like a Patrick Kane or a uh, blind Tarasenko or guys like that. Um, but did we think that he was going to go after the guys they he did go and Reiserman went after in the off season. So yeah. uh, it, it'll all depend on what Eisman thinks it needs to be improved. And like the goaltending, I think does need upgrading, especially the backup position. I mean, Helberg's having a heck of a time today at uh, five, nothing. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> um, and Adelkovic has had his struggles and he's a free agent as well. Like we've said, so uh, either of them may not be back. And there's some guys that are out there that they may be able to trade for as well. Uh, and that. Let's get to the next part of that question. Uh, do you see them involved in trades with teams that want to sign or not want, but need to sign these big free agents that are, they don't have the room to sign right now. You know, I think they, I think they will. They at least like, you know, engage in those conversations. Um, like I said, they need to spend money just to hit the cap floor. So yeah. one way or another, whether it's in free agency or, you know, kind of being opportunistic. They got to spend some money. <laughs> um, I so I expect New Jersey to do what they got to do to get this done. But if Timo Meyer <laughs> doesn't get signed by New Jersey because they can't make it work or whatever, yeah, I would expect them to. I expect the Red Wings to knock on that door um, and see what it would take to get him over. Um, I don't have many examples of players yeah. that they could cash in on where it's like, yeah, they're, that team might be cash strapped. But um, I, I did like vaguely answer the question. Yeah, I, I think they will. Um, they will utilize their financial flexibility, um, just like they did this last season. Like you said, Matt, they 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 went on a spending spree uh, this this past summer. They spent over twenty million in cap space yeah. um, just to fill out the roster, right? And as much as I think that they could just bring up a bunch of kids and improve their team next year, they got to spend money. So um, 
I don't expect them to go after like the Canes and Tarasenko's, like you said, but also they could. Yeah, like they definitely, they could. certainly have the space just to throw a bag at somebody. <laughs> um, I would. I, I, I'm not predicting this to happen, but I could see Tarasenko. We just talked about how they could. Uh, they they need somebody who can score, and Tarasenko's pretty good at that. So yeah. Um, yeah, I expect them to spend money. It's just a matter of how how they do it. Yeah, true. And Eisenman's gotten, I mean, look what he did this deadline, getting all these picks and, yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. And, so and and real quick to to that point, good, good. Uh thank you for mentioning that. Eisenman did say after the deadline, um that he doesn't necessarily have to use those picks at the draft. Like he's he's very much open to the idea of using them to acquire help yeah. right now. So if those opportunities are out there for him just to flip a draft pick for somebody, kind of like what the Senators did with Alex Dabrinkit this past year, yeah. I, I would expect him to be uh, engaging in those conversations. True. And uh, I don't know. I'm pretty sure it was an article you wrote about Carter Hart uh, in Philly. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> um, the Flyers are, are an interesting team in the offseason of what Danny Briere does because – they may may make a few forwards too uh, available, uh, and Eisman may be able to grab uh, some guys out out there. Uh, mm-hmm. We'll see. Um, but yeah, Carter Hart's an interesting one because he's still relatively young. It could yep. be a real long term solution at wherever he goes. I think he definitely is a guy that they could trade. So yeah, that's that's gonna be interesting to watch uh, what Eisman does because yeah, he does have some some assets that he could flip. And uh, like those draft picks that he got and, and he's already said that he's open to doing it. So uh, we'll see. That's, that's going to be an interesting storyline to watch as the draft gets going and on the draft floor after that, whatever, um, because he's got picks in the future, not just at this draft, but uh, later on as well. So it's going to be interesting. All right. Yeah. Well, thanks for all the questions, guys. I mean, uh, I threw out that, uh, that call for questions and uh so thanks for providing because we we have a whole episode that we were able to do and dedicate to. So um, let's get to our last off the rush and we'll finish it off with another question from Dr. Detroit. I added on and <laughs> it's talking about the power play. And uh, his question was, should the Red Wings power play coach stay or go? I um, want to point this out to Alex Tangay is technically, I get he runs the forward group, but Lalon said at the beginning of the season that it's more of a committee approach. So uh, let's talk about what could the power play, what, what does the power play need to improve either systems or players or whatever? Uh, Devin, what do you think about the power play? Well, I do think it's not a terrible idea to get a new set of eyes or, you know, some fresh thinking in that group. Um, if that's what it comes to, but you know, like you said, it's not one person who is at fault here. Mm. Um, I think that, um, I think this is where their lack of a finisher is like very apparent. Yeah. Um, because you know, you they've had plenty of power plays where they move it around well and they kind of get their looks and whatnot, but it doesn't matter if you don't have somebody who can, you know, finish with regularity. Um, that's, uh, you know, obviously the situation got really bad, but that's something that they, uh, uh, that's what Vrana was there for. That's what Vrana was in Detroit for was to be that guy. And, uh, they definitely miss him as a as that finisher. Um, I I realize that that's not something that's like scheme or you know whatever. It's go get better players. But yeah. like, <laughs> for, for real though, like yeah. they need they need to add somebody who can uh, finish with some consistency. You, you know you can't expect to go out and find a find an Ovech an Ovechkin. There's only one of those guys, but somebody who can score pretty regularly. If they can go get one of those, power play is going to improve dramatically because. Raymond moves the puck well. Cider moves the puck well. Larkin moves the puck well. Yeah. They got Edmondson coming. He moves the puck well. They got plenty of guys on that power play that move it well and can, and can create opportunities. It just comes down to who can finish them. And yeah. right now, they just don't have enough guys that can finish with regularity. Yeah, I agree. And the thing is, is you can have the best system and no one finishes chances. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you call it. So uh yeah, and Varan is having heck having quite the season in St. Louis uh right now. Yeah. Uh so change of scenery seems to be doing him well. All right. Well, I 
Thanks again. Thanks for all the questions, and uh, we loved answering them. So thanks to Dr. Detroit, B calls nine. Um, I want to get his name right. Right, French toast. Uh, Sixteen. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, uh, of course, Paradox for always commenting. Uh, we love your comments, Paradox, and uh, we love the comments from everyone. So keep throwing us throwing us our way. So we're not just going to have a comment corner every, just this week. Uh, if we get enough questions every week, we'll have one again as a regular segment. So keep those questions coming in the comments section. Uh, anything about the Red Wings, uh, make, make sure you're putting that down there. And uh, we'll answer them. And I'll throw out another call for questions as well, just to kind of remind you guys. So there you go. Uh, thanks, Devin, for joining another episode of The Grind Line. And, uh, you know, it's still, I believe it's still 5 nothing. Uh, so the comeback so was me. not on. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thanks, everyone, for watching another episode. And uh, thanks again for, for the feedback on our new format here. Um, we'll see if we can have a, a guest next week, but uh, it may just be the two of us again and uh, our defense duo here. So make sure to check out the hockeywriters.com for all the articles from Devin and all the Red Wings writing crew. Uh, as the off season gets going, as the draft gets going, there's lots of content that's going to be out there. Once the off season starts, the fun begins, actually. Uh, there's going to be a lot of content, uh, draft pro draft targets, our regular co our regular coverage there so make sure checking all that out and uh any coverage we have as the season winds down thanks again for watching and we'll see you next time on another episode of the grind line